My name is Terence McKenna, and uh, my training is basically uh, in shamanism and botany and ethnography. And uh, my interest is in hallucinogenic drugs, especially plant hallucinogens, as they're used in a shamanic context. And uh, what impels me to speak to a room full of people like this is the belief that the major important point regarding hallucinogens has been largely overlooked, even though we're now 15 or 20 or 30, depending on how you count it, years into the psychedelic age. The central point about the psychedelic experience is the content of the experience. And this has been uh, occluded or obfuscated by the behavioral and statistical and scientific methods that have been brought to bear to study hallucinogenic experience. So what I'm going to address this evening is essentially my own experience with hallucinogens and how I extrapolate it into the world based on its own being and other people's psychedelic experiences that I have interacted with. Uh, before I get into that, I want to clarify something about shamanism. There are two schools about the basis of, shama, of shamanism, shamanistic experience. One is the older school exemplified by Mercy Eliade, who holds that all narcotic shamanism is decadent. He prefers drumming, dancing, self-mutilation, even ordeal poisons all precede uh, the efficacy of hallucinogens. He believes they are resorted to when the tradition is vitiated and people are grasping at straws. I take this to be simply a cultural bias of the school of anthropology that he exemplified and the time in which his work was done. Now, Gordon Wasson has taken the opposite tack and takes the position that non-narcotic shamanism is decadent because it is on its way to becoming ritual. In other words, drumming, fasting, flagellation, all these things work to a degree and sometimes. And uh, they are not uh, dependable in the same way that hallucinogens are. And this has created uh, this plays on Western people's biases in favor of the idea that you have to work hard to get somewhere, and if you don't work hard, it isn't useful. My own experience in looking at non-narcotic shamanism, essentially non-narcotic shamanism in Indonesia and in Nepal, was that uh, Wasson's intuition was very correct. There is a grasping after, and I see that grasping after blending into the evolution of all higher religions. In other words, experientially, there is only one religion, and it is shamanism and shamanic ecstasy. But it is very difficult to maintain in an agrarian context, hunting and gathering societies, which have much less structured social hierarchies, seem to be able to function with the hallucinogenic experience embedded in them. As soon as you rise even to the level of primitive agriculturalists, it becomes much more important to be able to get up in the morning and go to work than it does to have these ecstatic experiences because the plants have to be tended, the fields tilled, and so on. Uh, I formed these opinions about uh, non-narcotic shamanism early in my career of looking at this phenomenon. Uh, I didn't contact narcotic shamanism until I went to the Amazon basin uh, initially in 1971. And uh, although I was familiar with the hallucinogenic state from uh, growing up basically in the counterculture in Berkeley, uh, 
But what I found in South America after sifting through these various experiences is that the family of drugs constellated around tryptophan, specifically DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and psilocybin, which is chemically very similar to DMT, that these compounds had a relationship to reality far different from all the other hallucinogens. Uh, the scopalamine, hyocyamine, tropane family that you get in Datura and that kind of thing, or LSD, which uh, laboratory LSD does not occur in nature, but isomers of it occur in nature, although to be taken at hallucinogenic doses, they must be taken at hundreds of times the amount so that's basically the scientific, medical, anthropological basis of what I'm saying. A career spent uh, in Asia and more recently in the Amazon looking at this phenomenon. And I want to take my conclusions tonight and contrast them with the modern predicament and try to make a model using the hallucinogenic experience a model that makes some of the anxieties of, of being human, and especially some of the anxieties of being human in the 20th century context, uh, more palatable. And to do that, I want to evoke a number of uh, abysses, a number of empty places that our minds tend normally to shy away from. First to invoke them, and then to integrate them uh, through the idea of what is conventionally called uh, the UFO or the UFO experience. These abysses are basically four embedded in a fifth. The four are the, uh, the biological abyss that is represented by death and dying, that is the... Uh, the central crisis of every individual existence and uh, almost as a reflection of that crisis on a higher plane the historical abyss represented by the end of history and the apocalypse and possibly the millennium but in any case the end of history that western religion whether it be Judaism, Christianity, or whatever, has appointed to our world and made basic to Western man's view of things, and which now, because of the existence of nuclear weapons and this kind of thing, poses a terminal threat to the culture. So, two abysses, the biological and the historical, the latter being symbolized in the apocalyptic crisis, a third abyss could be called um, the psychological, and this is represented by dreams, most uh, in general experience, and by hallucinogens. It is this casting off from the moorings of the ego, making the night sea journey into the other, and being at the mercy of call it the collective unconscious, the overmind of the species, uh, what have you. The, third, the fourth abyss, which is one whose emergence is unique in our time, is uh, the actual physical abyss which surrounds this planet for light years in all directions. Because suddenly now, because of our level of technology and, and scientific mapping, uh, we realize that it is there, and we realize that it is uh, a source of our cosmic loneliness, and we realize that it presents an immense challenge of the sort we like to accept as a Western culture, challenges of energy, engineering, and distance. So these are the four abysses, the abyss of space, the abyss of death, the abyss of the psychedelic experience, and the abyss of dying. And these four general categories have to be seen embedded in a somewhat subtler kind of abyss, which is the abyss of the unspeakable. In other words, that language, which is the primary tool of cognition of the species, casts nets against these other... Uh, 
gulfs and comes away with different kinds of maps. But you cannot, uh, you cannot put much trust in these maps unless you've carried out a thorough analysis of language. And once you've done that, for sure you will not put much trust in any of these maps because the thinness of the web on which it all is hung will be readily apparent. Okay. <laughs> it's my assumption whenever I am confronted with opposites is to try to unify them, to create a coincidencia positorum, as was done in alchemy, to not force the system to closure, but to try and leave the system open enough so that the differences can resonate and become complementary rather than antithetical. So I would like to unify here not two dualisms, but these four uh, oppose these pairs. You could think of them as the quadripartite uh, elements of a kind of mandala. The means to unifying that mandala is integration of the psychedelic experience. Specifically, I'm going to make the assumption, specifically the psilocybin or tryptamine experience. And what it appears to be is uh, something which is much more assimilable to the science fiction metaphor of a parallel universe than it is to the Freudian uh, metaphor of the repression of desire or even the Jungian metaphor of, an inter of a, uh, a collective species-wide memory and experience bank. It is, uh, it is much more, I think, of the character of a parallel continuum. And our, in order to erect the intellectual edifice of the past thousand years, this possibility has had to be ignored, much in the way that you would apply Occam's razor to a situation and just say, well, we will not admit the more complex phenomenon because we should form a theory that is true to the simplest phenomena first and then build out from it. And this has worked in a demonic kind of way in the sense that we have taken command of the, uh, of the atomic world, which is a very simple world compared, for instance, to the variables that you meet in sociology or biology. But at the cost of formulating uh, theories about how the world is put together that nowhere come tangential to experience. So we have... Uh, a bizarre situation where our best models of reality that are kept for us by the priesthood of science are like exhibits in a museum because they cannot be mapped on to the simple fact of individual experience. Shamanism, on the <coughs> other hand, is this worldwide since Paleolithic times tradition which says that y you must make your own experience the centerpiece of any model of the world that you build. No amount of readings from meters, whether they're metering cyclotrons or any other kind of instrument, are going to satisfy you. Once you understand that, then what the task becomes is one of making sense of these metaphors, so-called, or myths, so-called, that are the pre-Western, pre-print, pre-literate mappings of the world. An example of, uh, of how this problem distorts other problems is the problem of extraterrestrial contact, which is the way science presents the problem of extraterrestrial contact is that we are alone and that to assuage our cosmic loneliness we should build ever larger radio telescopes and million channel signal analyzers and sift the radio noise coming from the stars and eventually if a signal is found an immense philosophical turning point will have occurred and we will then place ourselves in the context of the cosmos. This is actually a red herring kind of argument because uh, outside of the highly technical Western societies that have evolved in the last 300 years, 
people have been talking to the other for since man began. Angels, demons, fairies, sprites, elves, all of this is as phenomenologically a part of human experience as, uh, we'll say, birds of paradise, which I'm sure none of you have ever had anything to do with, but believe inflexibly that such creatures exist because it is allowed by the experts that they exist. What uh, psilocybin focuses as a as a problem that these other hallucinogens do not is it allows a dialogue with the other that is full of give and take. In other words, there are entities in the hallucinogenic world that psilocybin and DMT and a few other not well known or widely distributed plant hallucinogens induce. I think it was William Blake who said, uh, the truth cannot be told so as to be understood without being believed. And this is the kind of information that is coming through the psilocybin experience. It is information which you have to believe it. You have to believe it because it has this ring of authenticity. It is the logos. It is the word somehow. And uh, what is being said is that our alienation, and this word is interesting, alienation, our alienation from ourselves has caused us to set up a number of straw men that are keeping us from building actually a mature uh, model of how the universe really works. The content of the dialogue with the other is uh, a content that indicates that man's horizons are infinitely bright, that death is in fact, uh, well, as Thomas, pa as Thomas Vaughan put it, uh, the body is the placenta of the soul. And this fact has not yet been assimilated because it runs counter to Western reductionist, materialist uh, empiricism. But this idea that the body is placenta to the soul is not a, an object of faith or a dogma. It's a program for activity. The activity that uh, it implies should be undertaken is a familiarization with the soul. And the soul has been banned from Western thinking about the self for nigh on 400 years, at least in leading circles. Uh, but I take this concept very seriously. And I think, uh, if any of you are familiar with the literature of alchemy, <clears throat> alchemy is about uh, the generation of a psychic construct a wholeness, a, a thing which has many properties, which is paradoxical, which is both mind and matter, which can do anything. This is the last gasp of the soul before it's submerged completely. In other words, it became uh, trapped in an, in an association with thonic matter in the last historical epoch before it disappeared completely from Western consciousness. Psychedelic drugs, especially psilocybin, allow a searchlight to be th thrown on these deeper levels of the psyche, as Jung correctly stated, but it is not a museum of archetypes or psychic constructs, as he seemed to assume. It is a, a frontier of wholeness, into which any person so motivated and so courageous as to wish to do it can go and uh, leave the mundane plane far behind. In other words, it is a dimension of vertical gain that is real and is present in all of our lives and that we do not acknowledge except as an anomaly because we have been told that it's an anomaly. We have been told that these perceptions have to be devalued. The result of this 
is to so distort the psychic life of the species in the present historical context that we have this UFO disease, which is essentially a rupture into three-dimensional space of this archetype of wholeness. And it haunts time like a ghost. And it haunts human experience in the 20th century because it is a symbol, symbol of alienation. And the word alien has, in fact, come to be applied to this thing. It is alien. It comes from the stars. It is totally non-human. It has great potential for mankind, but it can barely be Englished at all. And actually, what it is, is uh, the self in the form in which it is most accessible to the ego, given the ego's programming with all the scientific garbage about the density of life in the universe, the distance to the stars, the probability of chemical evolution occurring here and there and yonder. It is, in other words, something which in order not to alarm us, has disguised itself as an extraterrestrial being, but is in fact uh, the collectivity of the human psyche signaling a profound historical crisis. I talked about this before. I talked about uh, the danger of succumbing to belief in UFOs because of the damage it did to free will. And that, yes, the UFO is a... It is making war on science because science has created such a masculine overbalance in the intellectual life of the uh, species that uh, this automatic mechanism has been triggered. A history-stopping archetype is being released into the skies of this planet. And if we are not careful, it will halt all intellectual inquiry in the same way that the Christos archetype halted intellectual inquiry in the Hellenistic age. I don't want to go into this too deeply, but it's clear to me that Hellenistic science uh, was destroyed by the Christos archetype because the, Demo the Democritian atomists and materialists who ran Roman civilization had no patience whatsoever with this superstition that was being circulated among the servants about a man who rose from the dead and all of that went with it. But before they knew what had happened, their whole civilization was in ruin because the archetype had frozen the forward thrust of this masculine, dominant, ethically depotentiated, technologically obsessed, slave-built society. And for a thousand years, hydrostatics, mathematics, uh, metallurgy, you name it, that was nothing. Only the words of one Galilean radical could occupy the time of any intellectual successfully. Okay, we have now, 2,000 years later, fought our way somewhat clear of that problem. But the problem it solved, which is the problem of this masculine overbalance and uh, this obsessive technological uh, thrust, this dehumanizing thrust, has reached an even more intense peak and uh, now appears the flying saucer with the capacity of undoing that by again destroying science, by simply being a miracle. That's all that is required to wreck science is a miracle visible worldwide. <laughs> and this, because scientists say that that can't happen, consequently if it does happen, their house is in real disorder. <laughs> So I touched on this before, any of you who heard me. Tonight I want to talk more about the flying saucer, not from the point of view of uh, the people who are going to get the whammy when it appears unbidden, but from the point of view of an insider. In other words, one can do more than simply say, oh yes, I understand what this is, the overmind is visibly manifest in the skies of Earth in order to skew history toward an eschatological mode that will stifle inquiry in order, basically, to preserve the species from extinction. But a mature humanity, 
could get into a place where we no longer required these metaphysical spankings from messiahs and flying saucers that come along every thousand years or so to mess up the mess that has been created and to try and send people off on another tack. And the way to do this is to look at the abysses that confront man as species and individual and try to unify them. And I think that psilocybin offers a way out because it allows a dialogue with the overmind that is not, you won't read about it in Scientific American or anywhere else. You will carry it out. And the carrying out of this dialogue will place, will essentially eschatologize you as a person and lift you out of the historical context it's like Stefan Dedalus said in Ulysses, history is the nightmare that I am trying to awake from. <laughs> well, I would turn it around a bit and say history is what I am trying to go to sleep from in order to get away from it. In other words, the dream is eschatological. The dream is zero time and outside of history. Escape into the dream, escape, a key thing charged against these drugs that they are for escapists. I think the people who make this charge hardly dare dream to what degree <laughs> they are escapists. <clears throat> escape. Escape from the planet, from death, and from the problem, if possible, of the unspeakable. This, so now, to say a bit about uh, death and dying, if you leave aside the last 300 years of historical experience as it was handled in Europe and America, and examine the phenomenon of death, the doctrine of the soul in all its ramifications, Neoplatonic, Christian, dynastic Egyptian, etc. I'm sure you're all familiar with some or all of these. What you get is the idea that there is a light body or a, a, uh, a thing, an intellecti, that is somehow mixed up in the body during life and at death or at dying is involved in a crisis in which these two envelopes separate and one... Uh, loses its uh, raison d'etre and falls into dissolution, metabolism stops, and the other one goes we know not where, perhaps nowhere, if you believe it doesn't exist, but then you have the problem of trying to explain life, which, by the way, though science makes great claims and has done very well in systems of nuclear particles and even simple atomic systems, the idea that uh, science can make any statement about what life is or where it comes from is preposterous. Uh, science has nothing to say about how you can decide to close your hand into a fist and it happens. This is utterly outside the realm of scientific explanation because what we see in that phenomenon is mind as a first cause. In other words, we see matter. It's an example of uh, telekinesis. Matter is caused by mind to move. So science, ha we need not fear the sneers of science in the matter of the fate or origin of the soul. There, and as I say, my, my thrust into this has always been the psychedelic experience, but I've been thinking recently more about dreams because dreams are a much more generalized form of experience of the hyperdimension or the, uh, the mode in, in which life and mind seem to be embedded. And uh, looking at dreams and looking at what people with shamanic uh, traditions say about dreams, you come to the realization that experientially for those people it is a parallel continuum. The shaman accesses it with hallucinogens or other things which I mentioned, but most efficaciously with hallucinogens, but everybody else accesses it through dreams. Now, Freud's idea about 
dreams was, I forget the German term, but he called them day residues. He always felt that you could trace the content of the dream down to a distortion of something that happened during the day or, you know, during waking time. I think that uh, it's much more useful to try and make actually a kind of geometric model of consciousness and to take seriously the idea of a parallel continuum and to say that the mind and the body are embedded in the dream and the dream is a kind, not a kind of, but a higher order spatial dimension so that uh, in sleep you are released into the real world of which the world of waking is only the surface and in a very in a very literal sense it's the surface it's the surface in a geometric sense that there is a plenum and and recent experiments in quantum physics tend to back this up there is a holographic plenum of information information all information is everywhere information that is not here is nowhere and that information stands outside of historical time. It's like Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. Eternity it does not have a temporal existence, even the kind of temporal existence where you say it always existed. It does not have temporal duration of any sort. It is eternity. We are not, uh, we are not primarily biology with mind emerging as a kind of iridescence, a kind of epiphenomenon at the higher levels of organization of biology, we are in fact hyperdimensional objects of some sort which cast a shadow into matter. And the matter, the shadow in matter is the body. And, and at death what happens basically is that the shadow withdraws or the thing which casts the shadow withdraws and metabolism ceases and matter which had been organized into a dissipative structure in a very localized area sustaining itself against entropy by cycling material in and degrading it and expelling it that whole phenomenon ceases but the the uh, thing which ordered it is not affected by that and when I, I make these declarative statements, I'm making them from the point of view of this shamanic tradition, which touches all these higher religions. Everything, basically, except rationalism, holds to some version of what I'm saying. So then the psychedelic, uh, uh, the dream state and the psychedelic state acquire great import because they, there is then a task to life. And the task to life is to become familiar with this thing which is causing being and to be familiar with it at the moment of passing. In other words, the, um, the metaphor is used to, by several traditions of a vehicle, an after-death vehicle, an astral body, something like that. And shamanism and... Uh, and uh, certain yogas, Taoist yoga, claim very clearly that the purpose is to familiarize yourself with this after-death body in life. And then the act of dying will not create confusion in the psyche. You will recognize what is happening, you will know what to do, and you will make the clean break. And there does seem to be the possibility of a problem in dying. In other words, what I'm telling you is not that you're condemned to eternal life. I'm saying it's a possibility that you can muff it through ignorance. In other words, the, at the moment of death there is a kind of a separation. It's like birth. It's, the metaphor is trivial but perfect. It is, uh, there is a possibility of, uh, of, a, of damage, of uh, incorrect activity. It, again, William Blake, who said that as you start into the spiral, there is the possibility of falling from the golden track into eternal death. But it is only a crisis of a moment. It's a crisis of passage. 
and the whole purpose of shamanism and of life correctly lived is to strengthen the soul and to strengthen the relationship to the soul so that uh, this, this uh, passage can be cleanly made. Okay, this is not anything earth-shaking or it's well-known. It's a traditional position, actually. Uh, but now I want to assimilate one more abyss into this model, a, a le one less familiar to us as rationalists, but well familiar to us just one level deeper in the psyche as uh, Christians and Westerners. And that is this idea that the world will end, that there will be a final time, that there is not only the crisis of the death of the individual, there is the crisis of the death of the species. What this seems to be about is that from the time that there is an awareness of the existence of the soul, we'll say circa 50,000 BP, until the resolution of the apocalyptic potential, there's something like 50,000 years, which in biological time is only a moment, but it is the entire span of history times five. In that period, everything hangs in the balance because it is a mad rush from monkeydom to starshiphood. And in the leap across those 25,000 years, energies are released, religions are shot off like sparks, philosophies evolve and die, science arises, magic arises, all of these things which control power with greater and lesser degrees of ethical constancy appear. There is the possibility, as in the metaphor of dying, there is the possibility of mucking it up, of aborting the species transformation into a hyperspatial intellect. -y. We are now, there can be no doubt that we are now in the final seconds of that crisis, a crisis which involves the end of history, the departure from the planet, the triumph over death, and the release of the individual from matter. We are, in fact, closing distance with the most profound event a planetary ecology can encounter, which is the freeing of life from the dark chrysalis of matter. The old metaphor of psyche as the butterfly is a species-wide metaphor. We must undergo a metamorphosis in order to survive the momentum of the historical forces already in motion. Well, if you know anything about evolutionary biology, you know that man is considered to be an, an unevolving species. In other words, sometime in the last 100,000 years, with the invention of culture, the, uh, the biological evolution of man ceased, and evolution became a cultural phenomenon. Tools, languages, and philosophies began to evolve, but the human somatype began to remain the same. And, ha and so we are very much like people a long time ago. But technology is the real skin of our species. Man, correctly seen in the context of the last 500 years, is an extruder of a technological shell. We take in matter that is, uh, has a low degree of organization. We put it through mental filters and we extrude Lindisfarne Gospels, space shuttles, all of these things. This is what we do. We're like coral animals embedded in a technological reef of extruded psychic objects. <clears throat> and the tool is the flying saucer or the soul exteriorized in three-dimensional space. It's, as James Joyce said, it's the problem of how man may be dirgible, <laughs> right? And uh, how man may be dirgible is basically by turning himself inside out. In other words, the body must become an interiorized hologrammatic object embedded in a solid-state hyperdimensional matrix which is eternal so that man wanders through Elysium 
in his body, this is a kind of Islamic paradise that I'm putting out here, wanders through Elysium in his body, experiencing all the pleasures of the flesh, but not realizing that he is a holographic projection of a solid state matrix that is micro-miniaturized, superconducting, and nowhere to be found. It is part of the plenum. And uh, we, all history is about producing prototypes of this situation with greater and greater closure toward the ideal so that airplanes, automobiles, condominiums, space shuttles, space colonies, uh, starships of the hardware, speed of light, spin dizzy drive type, all of these are, as Merci Eliade says, self transforming images of flight that speak volumes about man's aspiration to self-transcendence so that we are, our wish, our salvation, and our only hope, basically, is to end the historical crisis by becoming uh, the alien, by ending alienation, by recognizing the alien as the self, in fact, recognizing the alien as uh, an overmind which holds all the physical laws of the planet intact in the same way that you hold an idea intact in your mind. In other words, all these givens which are thought to be so writ in adamantine are actually merely the moods of the god, if you will, which we happen to be. And the whole thing about human history is recovering this piece of lost information so that man may be dirgible. Or, again, to quote Finningen's Wake, uh, uh, Moikane is the red light district of Dublin. Here in Moikane, we flop on the seamy side, but up Nient, prospector, you sprout all your worth and you woof your wings. So if you want to be phoenixed, come and be parked. <laughs> so it's that simple, you see. <clears throat> but it takes courage to be parked uh, when the grim reaper draws near. <clears throat> A blessing in disguise, Joyce calls him. Uh, so to me, what psychedelics point out and where I think society will go once they are integrated to the point where large groups of people can plan research programs without fear of being persecuted for it, is it models the after-death state. It may do more than model it. It may uh, essentially reveal the nature of it, that our mind, what we each call our mind, can be the modalities of appearance and understanding can be shifted so that we see it within the context of the one mind. And uh, then problems like the existence of extraterrestrials and that kind of thing become trivial because the one mind that I'm talking about contains all experiences of the other. There is not the Newtonian universe deployed uh, throughout the parsecs and kiliocosms of physical space and the interior mental universe, they are the same thing. We perceive them as uh, unresolvable dualisms because of what is called, uh, or what I call a code, the quality of the code, meaning the language we use to discuss this problem has these built-in dualisms. This is a problem of language. All codes have code qualities except the logos. The logos is perfect and therefore it partakes of no quality other than itself. But uh, so long as you deal, so long as you map with something other than the logos, there will be code qualities. And the dualism built in to our language makes the death of the species, the death of the individual, these seem to be opposed things. Likewise, the uh, problems biology and by extrapolation exobiology pose by examining the physical universe versus the angel and demon haunted world that death psychology is reporting on is again set up as a dichotomy. Uh, all that is needed to uh, 
go beyond an academic understanding of what I've been saying is to have the experience of this tryptamine-induced ecstasy. In other words, for reasons which I leave to my brother, uh, the tryptamine molecule has this unique property of releasing the structured self into the over-self. And uh, each person who has that experience undergoes a mini-apocalypse, a mini-entry and mapping into hyperspace. For society to change in this direction, nothing is necessary except for this experience to become an object of uh, general concern. Now, what I, I'm not saying everybody should rush out and take mushrooms, in case you thought that's what I was saying. <laughs> but I am saying that these fields of information, which I don't know if you're like me, but my experience of these things is basically literary. I read Plotinus, I read Heraclitus, I read all this stuff, and I try to integrate it intellectually. But it is a plane of experience that is directly accessible. And uh, the role that, we, that each of us uh, plays in relationship to it determines how we will present ourselves in the final transformation that this hints of. In other words, in this theory, there is a kind of teleological bias. There is a belief that there is a hyper-object called the overmind or God or what have you that casts a shadow into time. And history is the experiencing of this shadow. And as you draw closer and closer to the source of the shadow, the paradoxes intensify, the rate of change intensifies, the, uh, because what is happening is that this hyper-object is be beginning to ingress into three-dimensional space. Uh, one way of thinking of it is that uh, the dream and the waking world and the world of the dream begin to c become one so that the school of flying saucer criticism which has said flying saucers are hallucinations was in a certain sense correct in that the laws which operate in the dream the laws which operate in hyperspace can at times operate in three-dimensional space when the barrier between the two modes becomes weak and then you have these curious experiences, sometimes called psychotic breaks, sometimes called whatever, but which always have a tremendous impact on the person they're happening to because there seems to be an exterior component that could not possibly be mental. This, what I'm talking about is when coincidences begin to build and build and build until you finally say, you know, I don't know what is going on, but it's preposterous to claim that this is a psychological phenomenon because these are changes in the world, what Jung calls synchronicity and, and made a certain model of. But what it really is, is that an alternative physics is beginning to impinge on, uh, on uh, reality. And it is the, the physics of light, essentially. Light is composed of photons. Photons have no antiparticle. This means that uh, there is no dualism in the world of light. And if you try to imagine l the experience from the point of view of a thing made of light, you realize, I'm sure you're all familiar with the conventions of relativity, which say that time slows down as you approach the speed of light. But what is never said about that is that if you move at the speed of light, there is no time whatsoever. There is an experience of time zero. So if you imagine for a moment yourself to be made of light or in possession of a vehicle which can move at the speed of light, there you can traverse from any point in the universe to any other with a subjective experience of time zero. This means that uh, you cross to Alpha Centauri, time zero. Uh, 
But the amount of time that has passed in the relativistic universe is whatever it is, four and a half years. But if you move at very great distances, if you cross 250,000 light years across to Andromeda, you still have an experience of time zero. The only experience of time that you have is a subjective time that is created by your own mentation. But in relationship to the so-called Newtonian universe, there is no time whatsoever. You exist in eternity. You have become eternal. Now, of course, the universe is aging at a staggering rate all around you in this situation, but you perceive it as a fact of the universe, the way we perceive uh, uh, Newtonian physics as a fact of this universe. So you have uh, essentially translated into this eternal mode that I mentioned time as the moving image of eternity. You are then away from the moving image. You exist in this static mode. I believe that this is, uh, is what technology pushes toward and that there is no opposition between you know, ecological balance and the people who want to leave the planet and the hyper-technologists and the hyper-naturalists. Uh, all of these are red herrings. The real uh, historical entity which is becoming imminent is uh, the human soul and it is the monkey body has served to carry to this moment of release and it will always serve as the focus of self-image but it will exist uh, in a world made by the human imagination this is what the return to the father the transcendence of physis, the rising out of the Gnostic universe of iron that traps the light, all these metaphors, this is what it means. It means release into the human imagination. Uh, very shortly, a, a uh, as it were, a dry run for this phenomenon will take place in the form of, of space exploration and space colonies, because there, the coral reef-like animal called man that has extruded technology all over the surface of the earth will be freed at last from the constraints of anything but his own imagination and the limitations of materials so that, for instance, the earliest space colonies of course there will be an effort to duplicate the ecosystem of Hawaii and this and that, you know, these like uh, exercises in ecological understanding to prove you know what you're doing. But as soon as this is under control, we will be released into the realm of art, which is what we have always striven for. We will make our world, all of our world, and the world we came from will be maintained as a garden. But w what Iliad indicated as these endless metaphors of self-transforming flight will be realized momentarily as the technology of the space colony. What is lining up right behind that, of course, is the fact that the transition from Earth to space is a staggeringly tight genetic filter, a much tighter filter than any previous frontier ever has been, even the the uh, filter, the genetic uh, demographic filter represented by the New World. It's said that, you know, the vitality of America is because only the, the dreamers and the pioneers and the schemers made the trip across. This will be even more true of, uh, of the transition to space and the technological conquest of space will set the stage then for the interiorization of that metaphor and the conquest of inner space and the collapse of the state vectors associated with this technology deployed in Newtonian space and then uh, uh, man will have become more than dirigible. I think a break here is maybe <laughs> in order. Let's have a break. <laughs> things and then there seem to be a lot of questions so I'll throw it open for questions but before I do that I, I mentioned this book The Invisible Landscape that my brother and I wrote and I'll say 
just a bit about it uh, because it relates to what's been said. I spoke in general terms about the uh, the technology which would interiorize the body, exteriorize the soul, spoke of it as a long-term technological goal, meaning visible within the next hundred or so years, following on to space travel, that sort of thing. Um, but what the invisible landscape is about is an effort to short-circuit uh, that chronology and to, to actually... Uh, in a certain sense, force the issue. It's the story, or rather it's the intellectual under underpinnings of the story of an expedition to the Amazon by my brother and myself and several other people in 1971, in which uh, my brother formulated an idea that involved uh, using harmine and harmaline these are compounds which occur in Banisteriopsis capi, which is the woody vine that is the basis for ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is one of these plant hallucinogens that releases you into this dimension I'm discussing. An effort to uh, use harmine in conjunction with the human voice in a what we called the experiment at La Chirera, which was basically... The, you can take it as very loose science or very tight magic, but uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it was uh, it was an effort to uh, use sound to charge the molecular structure of these harmine molecules uh, metabolizing in vivo in the body. Uh, in such a way that they would bind preferentially into certain molecular structures. Our candidate at the time was uh, DNA. I think Frank Barr has convinced me that there's as great a likelihood that it involves uh, binding into melanin bodies uh, is as likely a possibility as that it involves DNA, but it involves binding into a molecular site where information is stored so that this information is then broadcast in, essentially in the mind in such a way that you begin to get a readout on the structure of the soul. In other words, this was an effort to use a kind of shamanic technology to bell the cat, if you will, to hang a superconducting telemetric psychedelic device on the overmind so that there would be a continuous readout of information from this dimension. And... Uh, the success or failure of this you may judge by reading the book because the first half of the book describes the experiment, the theoretical underpinning of the experiment. The second half of the book describes the theory of the structure of time that derived from the bizarre mental states that followed upon the experiment. Uh, I don't claim that we succeeded I just claim that our theory of what happened is better than any theory any of our critics have been able to bring forward. But uh, whether we succeeded or not, that kind of thinking points the way. In other words, when I say, when I speak of the technology of building the starship, I imagine it will be done with voltages far below the voltage of a common flashlight battery. This is, after all, where the voltages, where the most interesting phenomenon go on in nature. Thought is that kind of phenomenon. Metabolism is that kind of phenomenon. So I think that you know, an Aquarian science or a science that places the psychedelic experience uh, at the center of its program uh, of investigation should be should move toward a practical realization of uh, of this goal, the goal of eliminating the barrier between the ego and the overself, so that the ego can perceive itself as an expression of the over-self, so that the anxiety of being cast into matter, of apparently facing a tremendous biological crisis in the form of death, 
of apparently facing a tremendous physical cri uh, uh, species crisis in the form of the apocalypse, uh, the crisis of limitation in physical space by being planet-bound, all of these things can be obviated by cultivating the soul, basically, by practicing shamanism using these tryptamine drugs that I've described. And my plea to scientists, administrators, and politicians who may be listening to my voice is to look again at psilocybin, to not uh, lump it with the other psychedelics, to realize that it is uh, a phenomenon unto itself and it has an enormous potential for transforming mankind, not simply transforming the people who take it, but it is like a, an art movement or a mathematical understanding or a scientific breakthrough. It holds the possibility of transforming the entire society simply by virtue of the information that is coming through. This is a source of gnosis, and the voice of gnosis has been... Uh, uh, silenced in the Western mind for at least a thousand years. Uh, I like to think that uh, when these Franciscans and Dominicans arrived in Mexico in the 16th century, they immediately set about stamping this thing out. The Indians called it Tianonacatl, the flesh of the gods. Well, the Catholic Church has a monopoly on theophagia, and was not pleased by this particular approach to what was going on. Now, 300, 400, whatever it is, years after that initial contact, I think that the uh, that Eros, which retreated from Greece and retreated from Europe with the rise of Christianity, retreated to the mountains of the Sierra Mazateca, essentially, and then was finally pushed into seclusion there, it now re-emerges in Western consciousness. And our institutions, our epistemology, all of these things are so shakily founded and so misconstrued that with the... Uh, help of shamanically inspired personalities, we can release this thing once again. I mean, the logos can be unleashed once again, and the voice that spoke to Plato and Parmenides and Heraclitus, that voice can speak again in the minds of modern people. And when it does, uh, the alienation will be ended because we will have become the alien. And this is... Uh, this is the promise that is held out, and I realize that it may seem to some a nightmare vision, but it is all historical changes of immense magnitude have had that quality because they propel people into a completely new world. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Essentially, it needs to be done through hallucinogens. I'm not saying that they're good or bad. I'm just saying that there are, appear to be many ways of uh, discovering that um, that the inner reality, the the ultimate reality. You want me to comment on that? Yeah. I agree with you that this is a strongly held position. I always, in my uh, explorations have recourse to my own experience and I've not had good luck with any of these other techniques. I spent time in India, practiced yoga, scoured the various rishis, roshis, geishas and gurus that Asia had to offer and uh, I believe they must be talking about something but it, uh, in my experience uh, it is so pale and so far removed from uh, the actual closure with the intense tryptamine ecstasy that I don't really know what to make of it. And I am willing to believe these things are possible. I just must be a very grounded person. And, well, maybe it's a, it's a shortcut um, for a lot of people. Well, Tantra, for instance, com uh, claims to be, that's what Tantra means, is the shortcut path. And uh, 
certainly uh, they might be on the right track, sexuality, orgasm, these things do have tryptamine-esque qualities to them. But the main thing about psilocybin, and I stress it over all these other hallucinogens, is information immense amounts of information. In my experience, a hallucinogen like LSD, the hallucinations seem largely to be somehow related to the structure of the optic nerve or they are essentially trivial. They are geometric patterns, shifting lights, this and that, but unless synergized by another drug. The classic psychedelic experience that started it all with Huxley and those people was, I believe, uh, 200 micrograms of LSD and uh, 30 milligrams of mescaline. And I would believe that that would deliver a, a, a visionary experience rather than an experience of hallucinations. And the difference is, what psilocybin shows you is not colored lights and moving grids, it shows you Places, jungles, cities, machines, books, uh, architectonic form of incredible complexity. Uh, just click, click, click. There is no possibility that this could be construed as uh, 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 noise of any sort. It is, in fact, the most highly ordered visual information that you ever experience, much more highly ordered than the visual experience I'm having at this moment of this room. But, but information in the form of a flood of data, that is gnosis. I mean, could you uh, spell out what you mean? It certainly must mean something more important here. Well, no, no. I think I talked about this last time, that Philo Judeus talks about what he calls a more perfect logos. He says a more perfect logos would be beheld rather than heard. In other words, the formulation you get in the Gospel of John, in principio et verbum et verbum cara factum est. In the beginning was the Word. Yes, it was the Word in the beginning, but this is a strange kind of Word. It is a Word which is visually beheld, and the language in which the Gnosis communicates is uh, a language of visual forms such that there is no ambiguity about meaning because there is no recourse to a dictionary of uh, agreed upon signification. It is purely beheld. This is why it's very hard, one of the main problems with psychedelic drugs is to bring back information, because it is hard to English it. And the reason it's hard to English it is because it's like trying to uh, make a three-dimensional rendering of a fourth-dimensional object. Only through the medium of sight can the true modality of this logos be perceived. Uh, that's why it's so interesting, uh, and I should have maybe talked more about it, that uh, psilocybin and ayahuasca, which is this aboriginal drug which uses tryptamine to make it run, is uh, <coughs> there's a telepathic component, which is there is a shared state of mind because the unfolding hallucination is shared in complete silence. And, you know, it's very hard to prove this to a scientist, but if four people are having this experience, you know, one person can, like, monologue it and then cease the monologue and another person will take it up. Everyone is seeing the same thing. Uh, and this... It is the quality of being visual information, to answer your question, Arthur, that seems to make this Logos uh, believable in the way that I quoted William Blake when he said, uh, the truth cannot be told. That is very powerful, that statement. And, and you do believe it. That, yes. You do believe it. But I was going to say that, that, that you're speaking of seeing, and we say QED after... Uh, demonstration in geometry, but the Hindus say, behold. Now, the seeing involved there, I wouldn't think of as visual, but it does get the word seeing, the name seeing. You somehow, their whole uh, 
what I was, I wouldn't say mind, your being resonates. I, I like to use the term recognize. Mm -hmm. you, you see that I say this is the same thing as the other thing. And I, I, I don't know whether it's seeing, but it, it is seeing is a good word, but it isn't. I wouldn't call it visual. No, well, it isn't exactly visual. I mean, again, to quote Philo Judeus on the Logos, he says that the Logos goes from a thing heard to a thing seen without ever crossing through a quantized transition point. And yet this seems impossible. It seems a logical uh, uh, impossibility because it is either one or the other. And yet when you actually have the experience, you see, aha, it is as though thought, which well, is the heard, aha, that's the, recognition. the thought which is heard becomes more and more intense until finally its intensity is such that with there being no jump or glitch, you now are beholding it in a three-dimensional visual space and you command it. And uh, this is very typical of psilocybin. Yes? I have uh, two questions. One, when, when you were talking in terms of the dialogue, I was wondering if you could kind of be more descriptive in that, in that regard. And the other thing was, as far as the effects of this type of experience, especially over, say, a prolonged period of time on the body, and the body is, as an energy system, and how do you, how do you balance that, or how do you counteract possible negative effects or... Okay, well, I'll take the last part first, which is about the body. I'm not an abuser. Uh, it takes me a long time to assimilate each experience, and I feel, you know, I never have lost my respect for it. I mean, I really feel dread is one of the emotions that I always feel as I approach it, because I have no faith that my sails won't be ripped this time. I always make the metaphor, you know, it's like sailing out onto a dark ocean in your little skiff. And, you know, you may view the moon rising serenely over the calm black water, or something the size of a freight train may roar right through your scene and leave you uh, clutching at an oar. And, I don't know, astrology is maybe helpful in figuring out when to go and when not to go, but s there needs to be a way to figure out when to go and when not to go. Now, your question about the dialogue, I, I mean this very literally. Uh, it speaks to you, you speak to it. It says things. I don't know how many of you have read my, the book that my brother and I wrote under pseudonyms called Psilocybin, the Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide. But in the introduction there, there's a rap which is all about, uh, I am old, 50 times older than thought in your species, and I came from the stars. And, well, that's verbatim, you know. I just was writing it furiously. And sometimes it's, it's very human. I mean, my approach to it is Hasidic. I rave at it. It raves at me. We argue about what it's going to cough up and what it isn't. And I say, well, look, you know, I'm the grower. You can't hold back on me. And it says, well, but if I showed you, if I showed you the flying saucer for five minutes, you would figure out how it works. And I said, well, you know, come through. <laughs> I remember once uh, I asked it, what was it? Uh, it has these many manifestations. Sometimes it's like Dorothy. Sometimes it's like a very Talmudic sort of pawnbroker. And I, I asked it one time, uh, uh, what are you doing on Earth? And it said, well, you know, you're a mushroom. You live cheap. It's very... Uh, <laughs> This was a quiet neighborhood till the monkeys got out of control. <laughs> yes. I want to get some clarification on some of the things you said. I can um, understand, you know, at least in my own way, you know, how this idea about. Um, an overconsciousness, or you know, casting a shadow, and um, that our 
psychedelic experience or dream experience has to do with getting in touch with that. But you said that, um, some, I'm not really positive about this, this is why I need some clarification, is that in some sense that uh, that uh, those brief experiences, that some, something about that our experience was in order to get back there, and that was the reason for us to be? Uh, let me see. Well, I think that this object, that, uh, as a friend of mine said, uh, history is the shock wave of eschatology. In other words, we are living in a very unique moment, 10 or 20,000 years long, where this immense transition is happening, and the object uh, at the end of and beyond history, which is the human species transformed into this eternal superconducting overmine spacecraft thing is casting a shadow back through time and all religion all philosophy all wars pogroms persecutions are because people do not get the message right and that's because there is both the forward flowing casuistry of being causal determinism and the interference pattern that is formed against that by the backward flowing fact of this eschatological hyper object throwing its shadow across the landscape so we exist there is a great deal of noise this situation called history is totally unique it will only last for a moment it began a moment ago it will only last for a moment but in that moment there is like this tremendous burst of static as the monkey goes to godhood and there is this crossing of the the uh, uh, I don't like to call it the casuistry but the efficacy of the eschaton this final eschatological object and the forward flow of uh, entropic circumstance does that get it for you? <laughs> um, maybe <laughs> Well, I, I have a little bit of trouble, of, you know, thinking kind of like which came first. Are you saying the chicken or the egg? Are you saying that this overconsciousness has something to do with? Uh, well, I'm certainly you know, saying that life is necessary. That life is that we. It is not the idea that we are have been skewed onto a siding called organic existence, and that our actual place is in eternity. No, there is something about, this is a very important part of the cycle. It is, uh, it is a filter. Remember I mentioned that I thought that there was the possibility of extinction. There was the possibility of falling into physis forever. And uh, so in that sense the metaphor of the fall is valid. There is a spiritual obligation, there is a task to be done. It isn't though simply something as simple-minded as following a set of somebody else's rules. It's that the noetic enterprise is a primary obligation of being in this circumstance. And uh, uh, your salvation is linked to it. Because if you do, and, and not everyone has to read alchemical texts or study superconducting biochemistry to make the transition. Most people make it naively by uh, thinking clearly about the present at hand. But we and I, we are intellectuals trapped in a world of too much information. Innocence is gone for us. We cannot, uh, we cannot expect to uh, cross the rainbow bridge through the act of a good act of contrition that won't be sufficient we have to understand and I recall you know Whitehead said understanding is the apperception of pattern as such because uh, to fear death is to not understand what's going on and uh, to even see it as a big deal is to not understand what's going on although I don't claim to have reached that exalted uh, plane but uh, cognitive activity is the defining fact of humanness. Language, thought, analysis, art, poetry, myth-making, 
these are the things that point the way toward the realm of being of the eschaton. That is what Joyce means when he says man may become dirgible. In other words, man may be released into a realm of pure engineering. The imagination is everything. <coughs> this was Blake's perception. This is where we come from. This is where we're going. And uh, it is only to be uh, approached through cognitive activity, I think. Really, <laughs> 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 yes. Can you comment on the um, importance of your discussion of the I Ching in your book? Well, very briefly, because I tend, I always have the feeling this part bores people more than any other because it hinges on tiny details. But briefly. The, what the Logos said to me was that time is not simply a homogeneous medium where things occur. Uh, you can think of it as a fluctuating density of probability so that uh, though, we, though science will tell us what can happen and what cannot happen, we have no theory that explains why out of everything that could happen certain things undergo what Whitehead called the formality of actually occurring. <laughs> and uh, this was what the Logos sought to explain to me. Why out of all the myriad things that could happen, certain things undergo the formality of occurring. And it is because uh, there is a hierarchical, a modular hierarchy of waves of temporal conditioning or temporal density or, in other words, uh, a given moment, it is more likely for a certain event rated highly improbable. It is more probable at some moments than others. And taking that simple perception uh, and being led by the hand, by the logos, we were able to construe maps of time which we run on a computer and which give a map of the ingression of what I call novelty, the ingression of novelty into time. Now, as a general statement, it's obvious that novelty generally is increasing. It has been since the very beginning of the universe because first there was only the possibility of nuclear interaction and then as temperatures fell and uh, the, below the bond strength of the nucleus, atomic systems could be formed and then as temperature fell, molecular systems could be formed. Then uh, much later, life became possible and then as very high life forms, complex life forms evolved, uh, thought became possible, culture was invented, then with the invention of printing and language and then printing and then electronic uh, information movement and this kind of thing. What is happening is there is an ingression of novelty toward what Whitehead and I took his term call concrescence. And this is a, a tightening gyre. Everything is flowing together. And in fact, the, the man-made lapis, the alchemical stone at the end of time, occurs when everything flows together, when the laws of physics are obviated and uh, the universe disappears and what is left is the tightly bound plenum, the monad, if you wish, able to express itself for itself rather than able only to cast a shadow into Physis as its reflection. And I don't, I speak, I come very close here to classical millenarian and apocalyptarian thought. My view of the rate at which change is accelerating and the way the gyre is tightening causes me to think, and the wave predicts this, that it is not long, it is soon. Uh, 50 years, 25 years, 35 years, then this event will occur. It is the entry of the species into hyperspace, but it will appear to be the collapse of, of the state vector and the end of physical laws and the release of the mind into itself. Um, and all these other images, the starship, the space colony, all that, these are precursors. Again, the idea that history is the shock wave of eschatology. As you close distance with the eschatological object, the reflections it is throwing off become more and more true to the thing itself. And in the final moment, 
God stands revealed. There are no more reflections of, uh, of the mystery. The mystery in all its nakedness then is seen and nothing else exists. Uh, but what this is, decency can safely scarcely hint at.